questions for you to discuss uh, the sermon that we'll learn today um, in community with other people. Maybe grab a friend, maybe get involved in a small group. There's ministry contact information. So make sure you grab one of these. It says grow deep, reach out. So our goal is to help you grow deeper in understanding who Jesus is. And we believe that as we do that, you're going to naturally then reach out and serve your community, serve each other. Uh, and that's our goal, to, to grow as, as followers of Jesus. Also want to point out this little visitor card thing. There's a little white card you'll see under the chairs. If you wouldn't mind, if you're new and have not filled one of these out, please grab this and fill it out for us. There's a box by the door. You can drop it in the box and grab a Grace Bible Church mug. Uh, we've got these high dollar mugs we've ordered just for you visitors. They've got candy in them as well. So all you have to do is fill out this visitor card and that mug is yours, okay? So just drop the card in the box, grab the mug, uh, and then we'll follow up with you from, from there. We have a question of the day. We're going to have you stand up and greet some people nearby. The question of the day is, how did you experience God's blessing this week? We're, we're shooting for positive, right? Not what's the worst thing that happened this week, but what's something awesome that happened this week, uh, uh, a way in which you saw that God was at work? Why don't you stand up and say hello to somebody nearby? Say good morning. You were broken for the broken You laid down your life that I might live A sacrifice so undeserved And all I have to you I give and all I have to you, I give. It's broken for us. Just thank Him for that. You were broken for the broken. You laid down. Sacrifice so undeserved And all I have to you I give my God And all I have to you I give It's Jesus, true and only Again, good morning. If you guys will gather in with us, we'll stand together and sing. Awesome. It's great to see you. Uh, we're back together, a family that God has called together um, to celebrate his faithfulness. Um, so let's pray as we come before him that he will help us to see him as he is. Let's pray together. God, you have shown your grace to us. We've seen it in your word. God, we've seen it in our lives. And so we thank you once again. God, we pray that you will move in us anew. God, that you will lead us, help us to see um, that you are working in and around us. God, help us to see once again that you are in control, to celebrate that you never change that you're faithful always. So help us to sing, help us to celebrate that, God. Help us to place the full weight of our lives on your shoulders. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing out together. Oh, God. 
God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou for. As we celebrate the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father and Creator, let us remember that He is also a, a holy Father. Let us open our hearts 
and, hum and humble ourselves, asking forgiveness of our sins. Take a moment of silence and do this. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, your continuous pouring out of mercy and grace on us. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help us, Father, to know you deeply. Open our minds to what you would have us to learn today. Give us a heart of worship so that we may lift you up in the goodness that you show us day by day. In your precious name I pray.
you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside flesh may fail, my God, you never will. I may be weak, your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail. stories of what they think you're like but I tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good, good father To you are, to you are, to you are And I am loved by you It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am Oh, and I have seen Searching for answers Far and wide But I We're all searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know Just what we need Before we say a word You're a good, good father To you I Deeper 
sing to you as a good father because of the price that you paid for your glory and for our good you sent your son we see your love display on the cross we see your love displayed in the empty tomb father thank you for sending your son God thank you for your spirit in us that's brought the dead to life. Help us to sing now, rejoicing with new hearts, marveling at the price that you paid for us to ransom us. Before the Righteousness, the great unchanged. 
love us with uh, a love that we cannot understand. That you, the God who is holy, righteous, and just, poured out the punishment for our sin on your son. God, that we, the human race, a rebel race, is the object of affection of the God of the universe. That you love each one of us. That you pay the price to adopt us as your sons and daughters. That you called us out as a people, a family. God, help us to encourage each other to think of the needs of of the other ahead of our own, God. To carry each other's burdens to see you in your word, God, to see the love that you loved us with first. God, give us that love for each other, we pray. In your name, amen. We're going to take a seat. Thanks, guys. If you have a Bible, you can open it up to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, we have strategically placed them nearby. So if you look under the chairs, you'll see a black Bible, and you can grab one of those. We'll be on page 941, I believe it is, on those Black Bibles, 941, Romans chapter 4. In this series in Romans, we've been being hammered with the reality that none of us perfectly represents God the way he designed us to. None of us are righteous. We are all, the the Bible word is sinners. We all fall short. None of us measures up to that perfection of, of always saying the right thing, always doing the right thing, always standing up for the right thing but we've all failed. We've all slipped from that perfect measure of God's holiness. Cool thing is last week, Paul presented at the end of chapter three, the amazing grace that God has for us in Jesus. That even though we've all fallen short, God gave us Jesus who took away our sins and gives us his righteousness. And now Paul's gonna continue that talk this week. This week we're calling it the pattern of faith and he's gonna show uh, how that pattern of faith and trusting in God goes way, way back. I don't know if you've ever been involved in a project at work where maybe you came up with a new solution for something. I don't know if uh, that's happened with you where maybe you thought, this is the way we need to do it. I've come up with this perfect idea that no one else has thought of before. And then someone in the office is like, oh, well, well, so-and-so did it that way last year, right? Has that ever happened to you? Or maybe you've coined a new phrase and you're like, hey, I just came up with this. And they're like, no, that's, that's been done before. Um, I, I like to be creative. Like I'm one of those people that values that like to learn and say new things and come up with new ways of solving problems. And so that frustrates me because it happens a lot. You come up with something that you think is new and then you realize it's already been done before. There's, there's nothing new under the sun. And so with our passage this week, Paul is saying, this is not some radical creative idea I just came up with out of nowhere. This is in fact how things have always worked. When we look back in the Old Testament, we see there's this pattern that God has always justified his people by faith. That means you were always made right, not because you were so perfect and so awesome, but you've always been made right because you trusted in God. You depended on him by faith. 
So Paul's going to show us this pattern of faith and how it goes way back in the scripture, and we still live by it today. So chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 12, and we'll see this pattern that Paul lays out for us. He says, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified or made right by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God or trusted in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Paul lays out a lot of arguments here. We're going to break it into pieces. Let me pray for us, um, and then we'll, we'll try to attack it bit by bit. Let's pray. God, help us to, to learn your word. We pray that you would help us to have understanding of, of what you're saying here and the arguments that are being laid out. We, we pray that you would help us to see this, this pattern of faith uh, where you justify, you make right those who trust you and rely on your righteousness, the external righteousness that we, we couldn't come up with on our own. So God, we pray that you would make us righteous by faith. You'd help us to hear you. I pray for those of us here this morning that are questioning, that are wondering. We, we pray that you just give us open minds. Help us to hear what you want to say to us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so the first bit, uh, when he opens up the first few verses, he focuses in on Abraham specifically. And so what we want to look at is that faith worked for Abraham. Abraham is the father of the Jewish people, right? And so this is kind of like going back to the most important forefather, so the Jews would look back on all the heroes of the Old Testament, guys you might have heard about in Sunday school stories, or you might just have heard about from culture, right? Like Bible people like Joseph and Moses and Jacob and um, Elijah, and we go way back, King David, he mentions him later on in the text, but he's going back really to the beginning with Abraham, right? I mean, you could go all the way to the beginning, we got Adam, but Adam's really just known for messing things up, right? Uh, and so we're going to look at Abraham, who's considered the father of, of the Jewish people. And the, the, the authors at the time that the Bible was written, all the Jewish teachers at the time, were always saying, well, look at Father Abraham. He was perfect. He's the one we should follow. He did everything right. And Paul's going to look back at Abraham and say, well, no, Abraham wasn't actually perfectly righteous. He was justified the same way I'm saying we need to be justified today, by faith, by trusting in God, not by doing righteousness on his own. Any righteousness he did flowed out of that faith, flowed out of trusting. So, so let's look at it in verses 1 through 5. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? So here in chapter 4, he's now answering stuff he said in chapter 3, right? So last week, Paul brought up this whole system of we get grace, we don't get what we deserved, right? We deserve judgment because we're all sinners, but we get grace, and Jesus gives us his righteousness. And all we have to do is have faith. So we're justified, we're considered righteous by trusting in what Jesus did. So what do we learn from Abraham, Paul asks here, our forefather according to the flesh. Um, just a little detail of grammar. If you're a grammar nerd, you might be wondering, does he mean what do we learn or what did Abraham learn according to his flesh or gain according to his flesh? Or is he talking about Abraham being our forefather according to the flesh? That, that could be taken either way. Um, and it really doesn't matter, right? <laughs> the grammar could, could go either way, and both ways prove the point that, that Paul's trying to make, okay? So is Abraham gaining something by his flesh? No, he trusted God by faith. Or are we really connected to Abraham, our forefather, by flesh? Well, no, we're actually connected to him by faith. So either way, Paul's argument makes sense. So sometimes you don't even have to really worry about those tricky things in the grammar. Verse 2 says, if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about. Remember last week, we talked about that whole idea of boasting. If you can boast in yourself, 
you don't need God, right? Hey, look at how awesome I am. I don't need God's help. I got it all together. But if you're broken and you're a sinner like me, then you don't really get to boast and you have to, you have to trust in God instead of your own uh, boast-worthy works. So he says he has something to boast about if he was justified by works, but not before God. Any of us, even if we have something to boast about, if we've done something good, we, we just, we're nothing compared to God's righteousness. And that goes back to the point we made the last couple of weeks about you, you might have accomplished some great things in your life. Uh, I use the illustration of a jumper. You might be able to jump farther than everyone in this room, but you can't jump the Grand Canyon. You might have done righteous, good things in your life, but you're not God. You're not righteous like God is. He is absolutely holy and absolutely perfect. So before him, your righteous deeds are like filthy rags, Isaiah says. And so maybe Abraham had something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He's quoting Genesis. Abraham trusted, that word believe in Greek is the same as trust and faith. So you've got believe, trust, faith. Those are all three of the same words. In English, we just kind of use different versions to have a nuance, to have a style difference there. But they all mean the same thing. It means relying on something. And so Abraham trusted God. Abraham had faith in God and that was counted to him as righteousness. This word count, I think some of y'all have different Bible translations. Do some of you have credited there? It was credited to him as righteousness. Some of you have that, yeah? Some of you might even have reckoned. It's a good Texas word, I reckon, right? So this means it's considered. And this isn't just like a mind game. This isn't God just playing word games. This is God actually moving the spiritual bank account of Jesus into your spiritual bank account. So it's not just word games, but he's considering, crediting, reckoning Jesus' perfection into your account. The, the theological term is imputation. So again, it's not just word games, but it's a reality that if you trust in God, Jesus' righteousness is yours. The most common phrase for this in the New Testament is that you are in Christ. You are protected in him. You're covered with him. You think of uh, the analogy of like Noah's Ark, right? Jesus is your ark. When, when the floods of life come, you are protected in him. He's got you. And so here, his righteousness is credited to the one who believes. And this happened with Abraham, just like it happens with us. Verse four says, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So how many of you ever worked with a time clock? Some of you had a job with a time clock. Raise your hand if you've used that before. Um, it's kind of old technology. It's fading. Some of the younger people haven't used one. I've got a picture here. What would happen is you would um, go into the time clock. You'd have a card with your name on it, and you would punch the card. It would say when you came in, right? And then when you left your work, you would punch the card again, and then that time clock card would go to the bookkeeper, and the bookkeeper would pay you according to what was owed to you, Right? So you see that? that? That's a different way of relating to God. Do you relate to God as if he owes you something? Chances are, if you're bitter at God right now, that's part of the issue. You think God owes you something. When reality, if, if you're actually, if you're dealing with God properly, and you're actually going to relate to him with a time clock, it's like you're wanting to punch your time clock for the three hours you worked out of the last 30 years of your life. And you don't want him to know about the $100 million you stole from his business, right? So it's like, if you're really going to be treated according to what you think you are owed, the biblical word for that is hell. That, that's, that's a term, right? It's not so bad in the business world, but spiritually, that's called hell, getting what we deserve, right? Like, none of us really has worked the hours enough to impress God or be owed anything from God. God, God owes us punishment, not not wages. The wages of sin is death. That's what the scriptures say. So how are you relating to God? Are you relating to God as if he owes you something? Or are you relating to him by faith? Like, God, all you owe me is death, separation. I don't deserve to be in your presence, but I trust that you're a gracious God that's forgiven me. And so I'm going to relate to you with the open hands of faith. I'm going to come to you and say, you don't owe me anything, but will you show me mercy? And what the scripture is saying is that that's how Abraham actually related to him. Again, these Jewish rabbis would say, no, Abraham was great. He did, every, did everything right. And we did our homework this summer. We purposefully studied the life of Abraham so we could see 
Yeah, I mean, Abraham was a good guy in some ways, but he, he did a lot of dumb things too, right? We, we related to Abraham a lot more than we thought we would. And so we see Abraham is justified. He's considered righteous. He's got righteousness credited to his bank account that belongs to Jesus and doesn't belong to him. If you want to use a time card analogy, he's given Jesus his time card. He's not being treated according to wages of what he's filled out, but what Jesus has accomplished. And that's how all of us can relate to God by faith. So to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. This would have shocked people, Jewish, uh, Jewish teachers and even Jewish believers in the first century. Paul just called Abraham ungodly. So we, we need to kind of like absorb that for a minute. We as righteous people, a lot of you had a lot of like ugly faces for me over the past several weeks as we were studying Romans because Paul kept saying, we're ungodly. We're like, but Dave, I'm, I'm showing up, right? I'm here in church. I'm, I'm a religious person. But Paul kept saying, no, you religious people are ungodly. You're sinners. You're wicked. Our only hope is that Jesus makes righteous the ungodly. That's our hope. That's what the cross tells us. Like if you believe in the cross and you're proud, that makes no sense, right? Anyone who's a Christian should be humble because the cross declares to the world that you couldn't do it yourself, that you weren't righteous, but Jesus was righteous for you. And so that's what, that's what Paul is fleshing out here. He's saying this pattern is as old as Abraham. This is how it's always worked. This is how it worked for Abraham. Abraham was also justified by faith, not by being such an awesome patriarch, but he was justified by trusting in God, by believing. And so he wasn't given the wage of death, he was given the gift of life. Two different ways of relating to God. The question is, how do you relate to God? Do you come to God on the basis of what you think he owes you? Or do you come to God by faith saying, God, give, give me grace. Help me to trust you. Give me forgiveness. I see that you are good and that you are kind and you deal with, not in the way I deserve to be dealt with, but according to your generosity. That's, that's the life of, of faith. This, uh, this word reckon or counted um, is an important word in the history of the Reformation. Some of y'all may realize that Halloween is actually also the anniversary of the Reformation. So uh, 499 years ago, Luther nailed some complaints. It was called his 95 Thesis, but he basically nailed some complaints against the medieval church on the door of the church, right? It would be kind of like in a university setting, someone putting up a debate, right? They're like, we're going to have a debate, and they nail a poster up on the wall. That's kind of like what Luther did. He was saying, here's some problems I have, I have with the medieval church, because the medieval church was, was teaching at the time that you could be saved by, by giving more money, by paying for more cathedrals, by doing more good works, by doing special activities. And Luther said, no, you can only be justified by faith alone. Now, that faith alone will transform you. And so James teaches us that faith without works is dead. So we need to be able to reconcile those two things. In Paul's writing, he often is talking about genuine faith. Real faith will change your life. And then James is talking about this thing that sometimes is called Gnosticism. It's the idea that you can just say magic words or know the right doctrine and be saved. And, and James says, no, you can say you have faith all day long, but if you don't have actually any works, if it doesn't do anything in your life, it's probably not a real faith. Just a year ago, we preached through James, so I would encourage you to go back to the podcast. Like if you're wrestling with that, how do those reconcile? How do those two go together? Because they seem to have a conflict Basically, if you look at it, they use the words slightly differently and they're focused on different issues, right? Paul's focused on your good works are never enough. And James is focused on don't just say you have faith, but not actually have faith. You, you have to genuinely be trusting in God. So it was actually September 27th last year, 2015, I was preaching through James and preached on that particular passage in James where he talks about faith and works and how that works together. So I encourage you to check that out or just look at James chapter 2. So um, the word here is logizomai. I just wanted to give you that because I know some of you are nerds and you like to have the cool Greek words. So you can write that down, impress your friends at the library um, and tell them this word means 
that Jesus' bank account has been credited into my bank account. Spiritually speaking, I have all the righteousness of Christ. When God looks at me because of what Jesus has done, he sees me through Jesus. He sees me as perfect and delightful. God is pleased with you through Jesus. The next thing that we see is that this was the same hope that David had, King David, another famous forefather uh, in the Jewish faith. So faith worked for King David. Faith worked for Father Abraham, and faith worked for King David as well. Verse 6 says it this way, Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, and now he's going to quote the Psalms. Verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So he's saying, see, that was, that was King David's hope too. It wasn't just Abraham. It wasn't just a fluke, a crazy father Abraham, and then they got it right. No, this is a pattern. It's always by faith. It's always a gift. It's always something that God does, not something that we do for ourselves. So he's quoting these Psalms. And what's amazing is that King David had, had every right to boast in external accomplishments, right? King David was the king of the Jews. He was like the best king of the Jews. He was the model king of the Jews. King David wrote part of the Bible. So he was a prophet, we're told as well, right? So he spoke God's words to us. And he had all the external marks of being a part of the covenant people. Paul's going to talk later about circumcision. King David was circumcised. King David read the Bible. King David led people in worship. King David wrote the Bible. I mean, he had, he had every reason to glory in his accomplishments, but he also knew he was a sinner. He was clear that he was a sinner and that his hope wasn't in being king. His hope wasn't in being religious. His hope wasn't in uh, religious performance or good works. His hope was in forgiveness. His hope was in what God had done. And so faith worked for King David as well. I grabbed a picture here that uh, this upset some people. There was like groans from the audience in the early service when I showed this. This is a report card with a big F on it, right? You don't have to raise your hands for this one. I'm not going to out you. Uh, but some of us have gotten report cards with an F, right? You failed. Part of the reason so many of you were frowning the last few weeks as we were studying Romans is because Romans kept telling us, you failed, you failed, you failed, right? And we were like, come on, I can't, I can't handle this anymore. Uh, and, and I want to challenge you that you need to come to terms spiritually with the reality that you have failed. I think this, this comes out in two different ways. For those of us that have just run full speed the other way from God, openly rebelled against him, sometimes we've built up such a, such a report card of spiritual failure that it's overwhelming to even think about. And sometimes we don't want to deal with it. And so we go down avenues that just numb the pain, right? That help us forget about it. And then, and then we're spiraling into even worse sins, right? It's another danger that happens with those of us that are religious people, right? And what we're doing is kind of like when a kid fakes the report card, right? We kind of know deep down we're sinners, but we keep kind of like erasing the marks and saying A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus, telling ourselves that we haven't failed, even though Romans makes it clear that all of us have failed, no matter how good we are, no matter how many righteous deeds we've done, we're, we're all failures spiritually. So what this looks like is, is in your own life. When you sin, you need to deal with that. You need to deal with the reality of your sin. You say, yeah, I failed. I'm a sinner. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then you need to not stop there. You need to take it the next step and say, but Jesus has paid the price. Blessed is the man whose sins are not counted against him. And you need to rejoice in the gospel. Some of you, you you've sinned in, in such incredible ways, you, you think there's no way that God can forgive you. And I want to challenge you with that. If, if you have sinned in such horrible ways that it's hard to even think about, it's hard to even face it, I want to encourage you that that can be a form of pride. In a sense, what can be happening is you're saying, I am, I am so awesome, God can't handle my sin. My sin is bigger and badder than any other human that's ever lived. But again, remember what Romans 3.23 said. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All alike are under the category of sin. We're all sinners. Maybe you've hurt people in significant ways, but God can forgive you. Maybe you've done things you swore you never would do. God can forgive you. That's the way the system works. We're all sinners, 
And we're all alike relying on God's grace. So don't think that your sin is, is too much for God to handle. You're not that awesome. You're not that big. You're not that bad. God can handle your sin through Christ. He took it so seriously that he took on flesh and he died on the cross for your sins. That's how seriously God takes your sin so that he could credit your account with his righteousness. So when we think about sin, stop and be real about it. Speak the truth about it. Um, remember Romans 8.1. Uh, we're going to get there in a few months, but Romans 8, 1 says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So when that sin comes, you don't just stay in condemnation. When it comes to your mind, you say, God, forgive me. That is sin. Thank you for the righteousness of Christ. Thank you for, for the forgiveness, the covering that you've given me in Jesus. So you walk through those steps, being real about the sin, but also trusting, believing in the forgiveness that you have in Jesus. Deal with it. I think another thing that we need uh, to learn is that if you trust in God's forgiveness, then he really has forgiven you. And that means then that suffering that comes into your life is not God uh, like stabbing you in revenge, right? So, so if you trust that God has forgiven you and you're going through suffering, which all human beings go through, that, that doesn't mean that God is taking revenge on you. I can't always explain your suffering, right? I don't understand all the details of what God is doing. I don't I don't think anyone could pretend to say, this is what's happening in your suffering. As Christians, we have a responsibility to weep with those who weep, to mourn with those who mourn. So if you're suffering, I'm sorry. That stinks. Nobody wants to suffer. But you can cry out to God and say, God, I know you love me. I know Romans 8 says that nothing can separate me from the love that you have for me in Christ Jesus. And you can cling to that and believe that. And you can invite God into your suffering and you can have faith in God in the midst of your suffering and trust him that he's going to do something glorious out of that. James 1 says that God actually uses our sufferings to do bigger and better things. Again, none of us want that. Don't pursue it, right? Like don't pursue a worm theology where you're like, I just need to suffer more. I'm going to whip myself and beat myself up. No, run from suffering. But when suffering catches you, know that it's not outside of God's control. God, God can meet you there in the midst of your suffering. He can use it for his glory and for your good. And remember Romans 8 that says that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love that God has for you in Christ Jesus. The, f the final takeaway, I think, from this truth that we're living under forgiveness is that we should then extend that same forgiveness to other people. So by way of application, I would challenge you um, that there's probably someone in your life right now that you're wanting to hold their record over their head. Instead of living out the reality that God is not holding your record over your head. So if God truly has forgiven your sins, if God has truly closed out your account through Jesus, then you need to treat other people that way. And it's probably a little overwhelming to think of all the bad people in your life right now. I would just ask you to pray about, like, God, who's one person that you could help me to deal with properly? Who's, who's just one person I could take some baby steps Who's that one person, God? Reveal that to me. One person that I need to show grace to, that I need to show forgiveness to because you've shown forgiveness to me. And I would, just, I would just start there. God, just begin revealing to me how I could begin to show to other people what you've shown to me. And, and God, God's gonna put someone in your mind. He might put 10 people in your mind, but just start, start slow, right? And begin showing the grace that God's shown to you. The last thing that we see is um, it's not just Abraham, it's not just King David, but faith is the only thing that works. Faith's our only option, right? So it's this pattern. It's not a fluke. It was there in the Old Testament. It's how God has always related to his people. And now this pattern works in this new thing that God is doing with the church where he's got this covenant people, Israel, but he's also got all these other tribes, namely us, right? All these other colors and shapes and people of different languages and different islands and different nations. We all come from different places. Most of us are not actually ethnically Jewish, but God is also saving us by faith. And so we are this, this worldwide multi-ethnic people that God is saving and, and knitting together as brothers and sisters, not because of our external markers. He's knitting us together because of Jesus and we trust in him. So faith, trust becomes the marker of this new people of God. Look at verse nine. It says, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say the faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. 
So is the blessing only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Um, just to review again, circumcision was a body modification. It was basically a cleansing ritual that the Old Testament people went through, right? So the male body part, you might want to wince a little bit, was surgically uh, operated on cutting away extra flesh. And this was supposed to be symbolic of holiness, right? And so the Jewish people were marked. Think of it almost like a tattoo, right? They were bodily marked. They had external markers that said, they are the holy people of God. And so they, of course, would take pride in that and say, hey, we got the marks. We're the holy people of God. And what Paul is saying, that anybody can be holy by faith. The markers are just like a sign that points to it. And we can often confuse the sign with the reality itself. Any of you ever been traveling on the highway and you're starving and you're trying to find a restaurant and you see the sign, you're like, hey, the restaurant's here. Or maybe you need to go to the bathroom, right? You're like, I really need to go to the bathroom. You find a sign. I grabbed a picture here, some highway signs. Um, there's a place we can stop. You pull over. Um, and then you realize after you've already committed, oh, it's like five more miles. Has that ever happened to you? And that is the most infuriating thing in the world, right? Because we want to closely associate the sign with a thing that the sign stands for, which makes sense. That's what signs are for. They are to point to the reality, but they're not always lined up exactly, right? That's what Paul is arguing here with this Old Testament reality of circumcision. It's a marker. It's a sign that's to point to the holiness of God. It's to point to what God is doing, cleansing a people for himself. But it's not always the same thing, right? It's not the thing itself. And so just like when you see a sign for a restaurant, it's not right there where the sign is. You still have to work your way to it. It's the same thing with circumcision. And Paul's going to say that faith is really the only thing that works. It's not actually these external markers. So we'll continue. He says, uh, in verse 10, how then was it counted to him? How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So the argument that the Jews would have been making is that the circumcision was like salvific. It's kind of like in today's language where we say baptism is what saves you. And we'd say, well, well, no, it's like a sign, right? I mean, it's a, it's a pointer to the reality of what God's actually done. We're going to baptize some people today and Baptism is a symbol of washing. It's a symbol of death and rebirth. But Jesus saves you. And so baptism is a, a pledge of a good conscience towards God. It's, it's showing your faith to other people, but it's a, it's a sign. It's a pointer. It's not the thing itself. And so what they're clarifying here is that Abraham was shown to be righteous, declared to be righteous, counted as righteous by faith. And then later on, he got circumcised. Like that, that happened later on. So it's really important logic that Paul is trying to unfold here. He's saying, yeah, there's, there's a separation there. And that these other things that Abraham did came later, but he was declared righteous on the spot by trusting, by believing, by having faith in God. Verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision, then later as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. So I hope you see again how like, hard Paul is pushing here. He's saying, so Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, is actually the father of all who believe. He's not just the father of all who are circumcised. He's the father of those who are considered righteous by believing, by having faith, even though they've never been circumcised. So again, in our context... What are those external markers that we say, this means I'm one of God's people? Baptism, church attendance, involvement, working in the nursery, giving money, helping the poor, doing lots of Bible study, right? There are all these things that are good things. Paul's not tearing good things down and saying, these good things aren't good anymore. He's saying they're external markers of something that God's doing in your heart by faith. Don't confuse those things. He goes on and says, verse 12, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So later in Romans 11, he's going to use a tree analogy. He's going to say, God planted this tree, and growing out of the roots of the Jewish people, God has one people of God. And this one people of God, there are people that grew out of the roots of being genetically linked to Abraham and Jacob and Israel and all that, that ethnic identity, but Paul says they're broken off when they don't believe. The branches are pruned. 
and that you only get uh, in that tree by faith, right? So you could grow up being in part of the people of God, but if you don't believe, you're broken off. And Gentiles who didn't grow up in that community, who weren't ethnically a part of the Jews, are grafted in, Paul says in Romans 11, by faith. So in the end, the tree is a tree of faith. One people of God who belong to the same tree, no matter what ethnic group you come from, no matter what tribe you come from, by faith, not by tribal markers, not by circumcision, not by uncircumcision, but by faith. So that's what Paul is trying to lay out for us here. We all belong to God by faith. We're all made righteous by faith. We're all made okay by faith. We're all forgiven of our sins by faith. And so we need to look at that as the real marker. Do you believe? Do you trust him? Or do you continue to look at these other markers? For you, it may be success, right? A good, a good sign that you're looking to another marker as the proof that you're okay and you're in the family of God is when you get really upset about it, right? Like when things go wrong in that area, if you're like, yeah, whatever, then it's probably not a marker you've put too much faith in. But if your world comes apart, that, that may be a marker to you of righteousness. You may think, unless my job is good, I'm not righteous. I'm not approved of by God. Unless my health is not okay, then, I, then I'm not righteous or approved of by God. Unless my friends aren't all okay, then I'm not righteous. I'm not approved of by God. What are those external markers that you're tempted to look towards? Repentance is turning from good things and bad things, putting our faith in Jesus. So we don't trust in our good works. We don't trust in our achievements. We trust in Jesus. And again, last week we saw that that doesn't mean you don't uphold the law. Yeah, by trusting in Jesus, God actually works a new thing in your heart. So you begin doing right things. But it's by faith. You're not doing those right things to win God's favor. You're doing those right things because God has granted you, credited you, his righteousness, because he's gracious, because he loves you. And so that changes your heart so that you actually want to start doing what's right. I want to wrap up um, by using Paul's last will and testament. His, his last book was 2 Timothy. It was the last thing he wrote. He was dying. He was old. It was, it was the latest book chronologically. 2 Timothy was a letter he was writing to a uh, protege, Timothy, someone he had been training to pastor and to lead others in the ministry to preach the gospel, and he brings up again this idea of this pattern. He says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He says, follow the pattern, Timothy. You've heard me preach this gospel. Stick to this pattern. The pattern of sound words, and the word sound in scripture is a word that means healthy, right? It's, it's the kind of words that give life. So if we're hoping in religion and external markers of success, that actually brings death and guilt and failure and bitterness and judgmentalism. And we begin to fight with each other. We don't actually love each other because we're orphans just scrapping and clawing to get ahead, competing with each other. But if we rely on the sound words of what Jesus has accomplished for us, not what we deserve, but what Jesus gives to us, not our wages, not our due, but trusting by faith, in his grace, then there's going to be life. They're sound words. They're life-giving words. We'll begin to live in a new way. We'll begin to love other people the way that God first loved us. Let me pray for us, and then we'll respond together in worship. God, we thank you for this pattern of faith. We thank you for showing us that, that Abraham wasn't righteous on his own, but he was gifted righteousness that he had to trust in from your hand. King David as well, he wasn't righteous on his own, but he had to trust. He had to have faith in the gift of righteousness that you give. Lord, we, we pray that you'd help us to be unified, not in our external markers, not in our tribal boundaries, but that we would be united in our faith in you. That when people look at us, they say, that, that's a person that's transformed by the grace of God. That's a person that loves others because they believe that God has loved them first. That scared me. God, we thank you for what you've given us in Jesus. We pray that you would bless the rest of our time of worship today in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody okay? Do we need a uh, heart monitor or anything? Whew. 
Huh. Um, if your heart is beating too fast, we'll have people available to pray for you after the service. <laughs> We're going to have prayer over here. Uh, a couple of folks praying for people after the service is, is over. Uh, now we want to spend some time in communion. And as I was hammering today, there's a lot of other things we might put our faith in, right? There's other external markers we might want to trust in. And so communion is an opportunity for uh, believers in Jesus, baptized followers of Jesus to place our faith back in Jesus again, to repent, to say, God, I know I've been trusting in these other things, but Paul says when we take communion together, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And so this is your chance to proclaim that in your actions, in the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup to say, I'm, I'm proclaiming your death is the only thing that will credit me with righteousness. And I'm going to rely on that once again, be encouraged by that. It's an opportunity for those of you that are struggling and feeling beat up by the world to be encouraged again. Say, Jesus gave himself for me. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I'd ask you to, to not participate in this part of our, our uh, service today, but I'd love to talk to you more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to trust in him, to follow him. I'll be just sitting on the front row if you want to come talk to me right now during communion or maybe after the service. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was having the Last Supper and it was a Passover meal with his disciples, which was a Jewish ritual of God's uh, salvation that he gave the Jewish people. But in that ritual, Jesus puts himself back into it and he takes bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way he takes the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so again, we're, we're saying that our hope is not in all the things that God has done in the past, but our hope is in what God has done through Jesus, specifically his body being broken, his blood being spilt for us. If you want to celebrate that with us, I encourage you to stand now. We're going to rotate around to the stations up front. Um, you can uh, stay and pray up front for a minute, or you can take the elements back to your chairs, but we'll rotate clockwise here and you can begin now.
has no sound Heaven can't deal Earth has no sound So if you haven't heard, we're having a parking lot party today uh, right outside. There's actually a little field. We've kind of moved it from the parking lot more onto the grass now, uh, but we're going to have hot dogs, hamburgers, bounce house, snow cones. So we'd love for you to stay with us and have lunch um, and just get to hang out and enjoy the beautiful weather. We just have a few of these perfect days in the fall, so let's enjoy them. Um, so join us right out here. We're also going to be baptizing some folks, so you can enjoy that as well. Uh, we have next week a men versus boys football game. Uh, it'll be around 12.30. I think the information's in the bulletin, but it's next Sunday after church. It'll be at the Ellison practice fields right over here, kind of caddy corner from where we are. Um, and just want to kind of define, when we say men versus boys, we're really thinking like teenagers, so junior high and older. Um, some of the men were not in very good shape, and we accidentally fall on the children and crush them. So, uh, so make sure it's, you know, 12 and above, I would say. Little kids can come, but probably won't be included in the main games. And depending on how many people come, it's going to be flag football and we might break into multiple teams for a tournament or we might just have one group of old people and one group of younger people going at it. Okay? So we'll see. I, I told you a couple of weeks ago that I broke my arm playing flag football, but it was